All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm in this Mark II Range Rover Evoque. The original Evoque has been around since 2011, and it's fair to say it's been a massive success. Some would argue that it's cheapened the Range Rover brand, or at least diluted it, but I'd disagree. It's helped Land Rover occupy more of the market share, and it's given them much needed profit. Land Rover have tried to make Range Rover a separate brand in its own right. So now you've got the Range Rover Evoque, the Range Rover Velar, the Range Rover Sport, and the Full Fat. As is often the case with Land Rover, they ran the Mark I Evoque for just a little bit too long. It started to look its age before they finally replaced it in 2019 with this Mark II. And I mean, the Mark II is more evolution, not revolution. You can clearly tell what it is, but it just looks much more modern. It's a much cleaner design. The design details on this Mark II just look much less forced than on the Mark I. Everything looks sleeker and cleaner and less fussy. I like the look of the new grille on the front, and also the bonnet vents and the side vents are just smooth, much more streamlined. I also like the new pop-out door handles which fold away neatly. Moving to the rear, I like the new blacked-out horizontal bar, which is a new Range Rover design theme which you see on all new models. I think it's fair to say, styling-wise, everything's just been tweaked and honed and improved just ever so slightly. And that's something that's true of the rest of the Mark II. Everything's just that little bit better. Moving inside the Mark II Evoque, everything's the same. Everything's just cleaner and more sleek and more contemporary. I love the choice of materials, particularly this. I don't even know what it is on the dash. It's almost like the stuff they make wetsuits out of. I like the new gauge cluster, which is half analog, half digital. I like the new climate control panel down here, which is all touchscreen, which isn't as fussy or as fiddly to operate as you'd expect. I'm glad they finally did away with the old rotary style gear selector in favor of this new joystick. I much prefer using this, it's just much more user friendly. I know this is a cliche when talking about car interiors, but it is genuinely a nice place to be. Thanks to the big panoramic glass roof, you get plenty of light. The visibility is very good. The big wing mirrors make seeing what's behind you very good. In fact, I shouldn't call them wing mirrors. I got an email from somebody the other day to say, oh, actually, they haven't been installed on the wing since 1973. They're actually door-mounted side, whatever they're called. Anyway, they are wing mirrors in my mind and always will be. I would say in terms of ride and comfort, it is very similar to the previous Evoque. It doesn't feel like a big Range Rover that's on air suspension. It's just on standard coils, and you can tell. It's not overly crashy or firm or anything, but you can just tell that it's not a big full fat Range Rover. As nice as this interior is overall, there are a few areas where you can tell they've been penny pinching. For example, this area here where you rest your elbow feels a bit cheap. Same with this top part of the dash, actually. Just like the previous model Evoque, the buttons for the electric seats feel quite cheap and flimsy too. I like how they've almost hidden the air vents within the dash. It looks very sleek. Well, I'm sat here at 70 miles an hour, and there's not much wind noise, not much road noise, and it is quite a windy day out there. If you listen carefully, you can hear the faint sound of the wind hitting those big wing mirrors, but that's kind of unavoidable. The rear space, I would say, is on par with the last one. Even me at 5'10", 5'11" can sit back there perfectly comfortable with plenty of leg room, plenty of headroom. The boots are good size, it'll easily take a couple of suitcases. Unfortunately though, on this one it doesn't have a power tailgate. In fact there are quite a few options missing from this model which just, it kind of irritates me. This is supposed to be a Range Rover, right? They call it the Range Rover Evoque. So why not throw as many extras at it as possible? I know it's all just business, isn't it, to try and get you to spend more money specking different options. But if Land Rover are trying to cash in on that name, there should be some sort of set level of equipment as standard. Things like keyless entry, a power tailgate, a heated steering wheel, adaptive cruise control, it should all be standard if it's going to wear that Range Rover badge. In terms of technology, you get this new widescreen infotainment system, which is nice and easy to use, and it's quite quick to respond. One thing I've noticed that they've placed all the buttons along the bottom, which is quite good as you're driving because you can kind of rest your hand on that bottom part as you're poking and prodding the buttons. Fine. But what if you've got long painted fingernails? Now, I don't, but I suspect most Evoke drivers will. And you won't be able to poke and prod those buttons with long fingernails, which just shows a bit of lack of thought from Land Rover. Under the bonnet of this one is the two litre four cylinder Ingenium turbo diesel engine. Now, I'm not a huge fan of that engine, as I've mentioned before. It sounds like a broken sewing machine. But in this Mark II Evoque, they've done a very good job with the soundproofing. You can barely hear it. And I'm a little bit bunged up with my man flu. But straight away, as soon as I got behind the wheel of this, I was surprised at how quiet it was. Because the old Evoque was quite agricultural. Certainly that old 2.2 litre diesel was, anyway. I mean, don't get me wrong, the higher in the rev range you go, you can tell that it's a turbo diesel. But it's not too bad. 
I'm at 4,000 RPM there. You can still barely hear it. Land Rover offer this engine in various states of tune. There's the D150 with, you guessed it, 150 horsepower. This is the D180, and it goes all the way up to the D240. Now, had I not have driven this, I'd have just said, go for the 240, don't mess around, just go for the biggest power plant. But this D180 does a pretty decent job. I think that's helped hugely, though, by this new eight-speed automatic gearbox, which is superb. The changes are seamless and swift. There's also a four-cylinder petrol engine you could have gone with if you didn't fancy this diesel. This one's fitted with a start-stop function, which I usually hate. It's the first thing I turn off when I get in a car. You know how they work. You sat there in traffic, and then all of a sudden it abruptly turns your engine off, and you panic for a split second, thinking that it's died. But this one works much more gently. It's kind of like a mild hybrid setup, so it will kill your engine as you roll into a gradual stop. You barely notice that it's turned off. And then the minute you lift your foot off the brake, it fires straight into life. It's as good, in my mind, as a start-stop system can be. I'm surprised you know Land Rover never offered the Evoque as an EV. I'm sure they've got one in the works, but it would just seem like the perfect fit. If they could fit it with something like a 32 kilowatt hour battery that gave you 100 miles range in the real world, that would do for most Evoque owners. It might entice them away from dirty diesel models which can encounter DPF issues. My advice for that would be, always run it on premium diesel. I've had this a few times over the years with customers who've bought diesel Evokes from me and they've had DPF issues, and the minute they switch to premium diesel, the issue goes away. In terms of its driving dynamics, I'm quite impressed, but then, to be fair, I was with the old one. It feels quite sporty to drive. You wouldn't expect it, would you, from a small SUV? But it does give you some confidence, this, to throw it into bends at speeds that you wouldn't necessarily think would be comfortable. Let's do a bit of a test then. So, I'm on a 50 mile an hour road. I'm currently doing 30. Knock it into sport mode and plant my foot into the carpet. Okay, yeah. I'm not exactly pinned into my seat, but all of a sudden I'm doing 60. Oh, there we go. There we go, 70 miles an hour on a 50 road. It feels very planted. It feels very safe and stable. It's like trees and that, don't it? In terms of running costs, you should realistically get about 27, 28 miles per gallon around town. And on a run, about 36, 37. The official figures will state more, but realistically, you won't get that. The road tax cost here in the UK, because they've had a bit of a shake-up with the system, will set you back £150 a year. That's just a flat rate. But if it costs more than £40,000 when it was new, for the first five years, you'll pay something like £500 a year. That's the government trying to make things a little bit more fair, which I do agree with. If you've got the money for a £40,000 brand new car, you should be able to pay £500 a year to tax it for the first five years. Then for the rest of its life, it'll just be a set fee of 150 quid. One good thing about the Evoque over any of its competition are its off-road credentials. This has got various different drive modes which you can change at the touch of a button. So right now I'm in Auto, I can change to Eco, I can change to Grass, Gravel and Snow, I can change to Mud Ruts or Sand. I think we'll keep it in Auto. You've also got Hill Descent Control. Now don't get me wrong, it won't be as capable as a Defender but it will be better than a Audi Q3 or a Lexus UX. Actually, speaking of Lexus, I've been driving around all week in a Lexus NX300H. Now, I can tell you straight away, even though that car's much older than this and done way more miles than this, that feels much more upmarket. And yet, if they were parked side by side, I'd choose the Evoque every single time over the NX. It just looks better. We're weird, aren't we, human beings? Choosing something that's obviously worse just because it looks better. In terms of reliability, this is where Land Rover really suffers with a bad reputation. I don't completely buy into it because I'm convinced that all cars are troublesome. All cars are headaches, all cars break, and Land Rover are no different. As always, my advice would be, if you've got your heart set on an Evoque, just keep a few grand back for repairs. Make sure you service it on time, make sure you look after it, run it on premium fuel, and you won't go wrong. Use prices for this Mark II Evoque here in the UK start at around £33,000, but that will get you a very basic model. You'll have to spend around 35 or 36 to get yourself a half decent one. Now what I would do if I had 36,000 pounds and I wanted something with a range of a batch is buy something like a 2015 full-size 4.4 Vogue SE or autobiography. But they are ridiculously big for UK roads and UK car parks, whereas the Evoque is the perfect size. Driving this today on these narrow country lanes, not once have I ever thought, oh hang on a minute, I'm not going to fit through this gap. Never. Whereas in a full-size, that just happens all the time. Well, I think that's about it. It's a very competent car, this, and a very worthy replacement for the very successful Mark 1. So, thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. 
you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know below, and I'll do my best to get back to you. So, yeah, cheers, guys. I'll see you next time.